Sullivan, who's the uh, chief exec of uh, the London Early Years Foundation. Jim, would you like to come? Hello. Lindsay promised me um, a sofa, a glass of something nice uh, if I came to talk, and she's not really delivered on that yet. <laughs> So I haven't done a presentation, which you'll probably be relieved about, because by now I'm sure you're experiencing death by PowerPoint. No offense to the PowerPoints. Um, so I'm just going to make it up as I go along and, and give you some pushback, I think, from an employer perspective. So um, I'm the CEO of the London Early Years Foundation, and we run 38 nurseries across London. And I employ uh, 650 staff, and I have 4,500 children come to see us every day for care and education. And 60% of my nurseries are outstanding, and um, we subsidise, because we're a social enterprise, we subsidise, I think, 43% of our children last year. Um, demythicizing the notion that um, because you work with the poor or in poor neighborhoods, you don't deliver the best. Um, we take 60 apprentices, and um, we talked about the Z millennials and Z class and Z everything this morning. And um, I was thinking, I must be the alphabet class then, because I can remember the days of the NVQs. And I can probably remember, because we were the first cash assessment centre back in, I must have been 1992, 94? Anyway, in the 90s. I don't know what we were called in those days. I'm sure we weren't called anything. Um, we weren't the Z class or the uh, millennials or anything. We were just people, I guess. But do you remember the D32s and the D33s? Do you remember all them? I remember all of those, and we did them right at the beginning, actually. Um, and then we were turned into bettles and dettles and petals. Remember all of that? So we became a disinfectant. And now we're an IQA, our equality person, and you have to do everything online, which is a bit not great for me. I'm working on that principle. But anyway, um, so I, I've been through the whole kind of gamut of this. And um, for us, trainees, and then students, then learners, and candidates, and apprentices, are all part of our HR pipeline. So Julie made a reference earlier to the story of where you start. Do you start in a school? Do you start at, um, you know, along the way? Do you find people on the street? How do you do it? And actually, that's very important because the journey, I think, is critical in terms of how we sell the story of apprentices. I love my apprentices, actually. I know every single one of them, and, um, and they challenge me. And I do feel sometimes like I'm their mother. Um, and I probably behave just like their mother to them sometimes as well, I have to say. But, you know, there are 60 of them. And uh, last year, 100% of ours completed their level three. And, um, and they're now employed and working for me. And I have stories all the way through from those who came and who are now managers in the sector and so on and so forth. So I don't need much persuasion about this. However, the thing about business is that complexity is the silent killer of a business. And... Um, I think that's a really important factor. And a lot of the things that are thrown at us and are being thrown at us now are complex. And they make our lives difficult. And if you think um, how you might help. So you've talked a lot today about helping. Uh, warding bodies talking about helping. Uh, in, um, assessment centers, providers. Uh, all sorts of people today talked about helping employers. So the first thing is remove the complexity. So those of you who are making this up in the middle of the night, figuring out the levy, working about the kind of pushback that you know, we have to have, thinking about the way we have to claim money back and all of those things, just think about what it feels like when you're in a medium-sized business and you're trying to manage all of this and try and keep the show on the road. So the first pushback to you guys is sort out the complexity. The second thing is funding. Um, so the second funding, the pushback on funding is this. There's a, there's a great myth about uh, early years. We're often referred to as nice but dim. And we spend a lot of time washing hands is one of the perceptions. And I remember sitting on the, the Not Brown Review and I remember Cathy saying, you know, it's a hair or care dilemma here. So you can go and be a hairdresser or you can go in early years because that's about the options open to you. And it's interesting because the funding 
for early years is less than hairdressing. So we're likely to be all losing everybody to hairdressing because you get £3,000 for hairdressing and two fifty for uh, early years. So that sort of puts a perspective on it that I think probably needs consideration. Um, the other thing I think we have to think about is in, uh, there was a lot of talk today about disadvantage and apprenticeship being the route to disadvantage and the way of actually addressing disadvantage. In London, one in 10 young people remain a neat. And as a consequence of that, we have 89,000 people who constitute being a neat. So in our rush to um, elevate apprenticeships to the root of um, all success, we must be careful that we don't lose along the way those very students, those very people who are main neat and who remain then ex outside of the whole employment and education opportunities. And I worry about that because as it becomes more, um, I don't know, attractive to be um, an apprentice, we actually lose the very people we were often set up to, to work from. So uh, I, that's a consideration for us to consider as well. And it was a big issue in the early years when we talked about the A to C uh, maths and English GCSEs, because we saw a complete drop in people who weren't able to do that. And then with functional skills being reduced, we actually saw an increase in the very people that we didn't really need to attract and a decrease in the people we wanted to support. So you also asked the question about what drives apprentices and how do you get them? And I think we have to think really carefully about this. So one of my apprentices is a social media apprentice, which I've never heard of, I have to say. Um, but I'm a great tweeter, Twitter, um, I'm at, at Juno Sullivan, and if you want to tweet any of the rubbish I've just said out, you can. Um, and effectively, um, we need to think about how do we attract people. And I also want to attract older people. Now, in the world of apprenticeship, anyone over 24 is disguised as old. So that's a little bit of a worry for those of us who have hit 50 and above. Um, but I would like some more older people, and I would like some focus on that, because they bring a balance to the workplace, as indeed does gender. Because again, in, sec in our sector, there's a lot of women. There's not enough of men. But we know that the fact around gender balanced workplaces, no matter whether they're cars or children, is that you drive better profit when you have men and women working together you know, more effectively. So that's quite a, a useful kind of pushback again from the uh, employer perspective as to how do you how do you find apprentices and how do you attract them? And then when you get them, how do you assess them and how do you collect data on them? So we get a lot of input and output data how many come, how many stay, but we don't really measure a lot of things about long term, about promotion, about changing the world, about doing all the sort of longer things we'd like to be able to demonstrate um, in, in, the, in the longer term. And I think there's some work to be done, especially for employers, because it's a good, I mean, I, I have to say, I speak to quite a lot of my apprentices' parents about them as they ring up and they obviously think I'm the head teacher or something and they k tell us off for, for stuff like expecting them to be in on time, a kind of challenge like that. So we spend a lot of time doing step into learning and buying them clocks and talking to their parents about this is work, this is real stuff. Um, and I think there's quite a lot we could do more about the reality of what that feels like. But we also found that we attracted more apprentices if you did things like a pizza evening if you didn't sell it like it was an employer job interview. I couldn't be bothered with CVs. You, know, you can get them on the internet and just doctor them. I think it's a much more about expect expectations of their, their trays and their humanity and their sense and willingness to do stuff. That's much more interesting for me. And I think as a consequence, we're much better at keeping our apprentices and promoting them and giving them long-term jobs when you get that right. So I think there's a whole shift needs to be thought about in terms of how do you generate interest so that young people and older people are attracted to the apprentices model. And there's something about the status as well, about driving it up. So finally, <laughs> chefs. I want someone to help me with chefs. Because we wrote the standard for chefs, because if you have a nursery, you have a chef. And chefs are a very important par part of this whole process. So we are a whole program for chefs. And it's really hard to develop chefs, because what you tend to do is put people in boxes. But if you're running a good nursery, you have a really good chef, because you want to feed the children really good food. 
And so we need to think also, as when we're thinking about apprentices, not to box them off so much, but actually to think about integration and the whole journey becoming a much more integrated one around the service of the service of the child or the service of the family, rather than simply the industry space. I rest my case. Don't panic. Thank <laughs> you.